next hour on this program. An operatic interpretation of the boy in the striped pyjamas opens tonight. We'll be hearing from the composer. We'll also be hearing about the podcast uh, the BBC has about uh, Shamima Begum. You're listening to Today on BBC Radio 4. It's 8 o'clock on Wednesday, the 11th of January. The headlines this morning. NHS trusts a warning that a strike by... Actually, Valkyrie, we've got to leave it there. Thank you very much. It's 22 minutes past eight. The best-selling 2006 book, The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas, now, has now become an opera as well as a film. A young composer who was 19 when he started work inspired by it is bringing the completed production to a London theatre tonight and tomorrow. It's called A Child in Striped Pyjamas. Why is the boy Composer of a child in striped pajamas is here in the studio. Morning, Noah. Congratulations. Thank you. Good morning. Tell us first of all what we heard there. Two women's voices. When the main characters in a book, as in the book, as most people will know, are two young boys. That's right. So you just heard the voices of soprano Susanna McRae and mezzo soprano Rachel Roper, um, who are playing the German child and the Jewish child, respectively. When I started writing the piece, I did think briefly about whether it would be possible to write it for children or to involve a children's chorus. It soon became clear to me that the demands of the piece, both technically and emotionally, were going to be too much for that. So I decided we would um, uh, have women's voices for the children. And then we've also got a tenor and a baritone bass um, as the, the Nazi characters. But they, the, So the characters do follow the characters that... The, from the book, including the camp commandant? No, absolutely, yes. So uh, we've got the two children. Um, so in, in the context of this story, they are known not by their names, but as the German child and the Jewish child. Uh, the symbolism is about children, um, and children symbolize innocence. And this story is about the destruction of humanity's innocence in a way that is irreparable. That's the symbolic truth, uh, the kernel of truth at the bottom of the story which I think is what has resonated so deeply with people, which is why it's been so successful, despite what some people insist on calling, you know, these surface-level inaccuracies. I think the book is, on balance, more true than it is false. We'll come to that in a moment. I'm interested, you as a musician, you are you are creating beauty. Mm. That you, you are using this very tough subject matter and this very hard, painful subject matter, and I think including for your own family, mm. and trying to create a thing of beauty out of it. Well, I think maybe beauty is, is perhaps not quite the right word to use. Um, not all art is beautiful. Art can disturb us. Art can challenge us. Um, I mean, this is a deeply personal topic matter. I lost family members in the Holocaust. It's more an accident of fate than anything else that... Um, two members of our family were able to escape Vienna in time, uh, and therefore my, my family is here. Uh, uh, opera is a, a very self-consciously artificial genre, in a sense, um, and it can be incredibly painful. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, that's what it is I've tried to lean into with this. It's not that I'm trying to create something beautiful uh, out of something which is quite clearly horrific. I mean, th this is the basis of the debate. I think people who have problems with the book are actually getting at a deeper problem. They may not know they are, but it's it's something that Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel brought up. Uh, he said uh, there can be no nobody could. His quote. He's quoted as saying um, there can be nobody could have imagined Auschwitz before Auschwitz. Nobody can retell Auschwitz after Auschwitz. Either it's in your bones or it's not. Uh, that's a, a slight, slightly misquoting him. Um, it's. A, I would, you know, caution against. So when we look at Holocaust testimony, obviously we need to be incredibly careful, you know, about being chapter and verse, about how we approach these um, these texts. They're essentially sacred. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that we have these texts at all, people who have survived literal hell on earth. Um, however, when it comes to the personal views of those who wrote the testimony, uh, it's important that we are critical in the way that we're critical about any text. I mean, um, Viktor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning. That was an existential approach to his experience of the Holocaust. He said, the one thing they can't get at is what's inside your head. So it's all about how you choose to approach this. George Orwell disagreed but, in 1984. Let's just, let's just talk about John Boyne and, the, and his yeah. portrayal, though, because it, it's, it, it, it's not 
completely just about the fact that whether you know it's ever appropriate to have a work of fiction it's it's more that the Auschwitz Memorial Museum were among those who said it's a distortion of what happened that's different isn't it distorting the events that the fact remains that a friendship such as the one at the heart of the book and your opera could never have happened distortion is a is a really strong word and i understand why people are you know because it's this topic i can understand why people would want to be touchy about it uh, as an artist for me it's kind of a moot point because i want to make art about the stuff which is deeply important to me and in order to do that as with anything else you're going to need to take a certain level of creative license. What I think John Boyne has done really well in this story is stick to the symbolic truth, which is the same truth that Primo Levi is getting at in If, if This Is A Man, uh, which is this idea that no longer could we be in any doubt as to what it is humanity is capable of. Um, and of course, so the children could never have, have met in real life. I think that's a fairly commonly uh, accepted fact. Um, what adults miss, which children get in the book, which they may not be able to articulate it, yet but the first conversation the children have is about the fact they have the same birthday um and actually out of interest uh, that birthday is the birthday of john boyne's father so that was his personal connection with the topic matter he's not jewish um but he could have you know that could have been his father is what he's trying to say with that and, and so children get that they're actually not two children at all they're two sides of the same child who by a twist of fate happen to have grown up on either side of this fence yeah. And you read it as a child, so that's your starting point for, for your response to it. I think, given that it's only on tonight and tomorrow, and I think the performance is already sold out, uh, for anyone who wants to see it and is not going to make it, how could they? Well, we're hoping that in the future it's going to uh, be available in some, you know, online in some sense. Uh, at the moment, we don't have the permission from Miramax to do that. We hope that will be forthcoming, uh, and we hope that there will be plenty more performances in the future. Miramax, thanks very much. Thank you. 29 minutes past eight to the Sport and Rock. Hi there, Justin. Majesty.